Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joseph Helfenstein, and it's a great pleasure to see you all for this wonderful event. And in case uh, any of you in the back want a seat, we do have seats, both over there and over here and in, in, in both directions of the hallway. So please, please help yourself. And before I start, may I also ask you, as always, to please turn off your cell phones and all these things we are living with uh, today all the time. Thank you so much. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, among our guests tonight Professor Arden Reed, who speaks tomorrow uh, here at 7 p.m. Um, uh, at the Menil. Uh, his, his talk will be, is called Slow Art. Um, I haven't met him yet, but I know he's here. Wonderful. Welcome. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fifth and final program organized by Dario Robletto as part of his exhibition, The Boundary of Life is Quietly Crossed. In this project, he has taken the fascinating convergence of the history of the space race and the creation of the artificial human heart as his point of departure. In the process, he has woven together an, a human narrative that is as poignant as it is powerful. If you have been with us through these series, the journey from art to science and from medicine to outer space has been a wonderful ride. And I thank you, Dario, for your most thoughtful approach to these programs. I would also like to thank the Mitchell Center for the Arts at the University of Houston and to director Karen Farber. Karen is, is right there. Yeah. And, uh, and Karen's staff. We are proud to partner with the Mitchell Center for this presentation. Uh, together we, uh, as probably many of you know, we have actually funded a joint research residency for uh, the artists that importantly led to this commission. And I would also like to thank Michelle White, the curator of this uh, show. <laughs> as well as Carl Killian, director of public programs and <laughs> And Tony Martinez, who is uh, uh, running around all the time, and we all uh, really appreciate their work. Wow. Okay, and I'm sorry, you have to go on with a few more thanks, so please bear with me before we go to... Uh, and I, I, because I do want to really uh, thank those who supported this project. You know, there is this kind of myth in the world that the Manil is so wealthy, we don't need to raise any money, and it's really not true. We do, and we, it's a significant part of what we do. Every single show, every single program, every single publication, all of it has to be erased every year. And therefore, we are really grateful to all of uh, those, many of which are here, who support the Manil and its exhibitions and programs. Those who supported this show are Eddie and Chinui Allen, Robert Card, MD, and Carl, Carol Kramer, jerry Ann and Holland Janey, Alison and David Ayers, the Brown Foundation, Brad and Leslie Booker, Anne and Jack Morinier, and Bridget and Patrick Wade. Thank you all so much for this, for your support. And now I would like to move to our uh, wonderful special guest tonight and would like to first welcome Mimi Swartz. Mimi is the ex executive editor of Texas Monthly. She, her new book is an ex exploration of the 50 year quest to build the artificial heart. When Houston emerged as a medical mecca and doctors such as Michael DeBakey and Denton Cooley and our, our two guests tonight, O.H. Frazier and William Cohn, won worldwide fame. It will be published, her book, in 2016. She will be joined tonight in discussion with Dario and two of these doctors. 
Dr. William E. Billy Cohn, a cardiac surgeon, is director of the Center for Technology and Innovation and co-director of the Cullen Cardiovascular Research Laboratory at the Texas Heart Institute at St. Luke's Medical Center. Dr. Cohn is also a professor of surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Cohn received his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine, where he served as the last chief resident under the legendary Michael E. DeBakey. With a passion for medical device development, Dr. Cohn has more than, seven, more than 90 US patents granted or pending, and another 60 international patents for his medical innovations. That is unbelievable, and uh, worth an applause, I think. <laughs> and our second a very distinguished guest, Dr. O. H. Bud Frazier, is chief of the Center for Cardiac Support and director of cardiovascular surgery research at the Texas Heart Institute. He has been a pioneer in the treatment of severe heart failure and in the fields of heart transplantation and artificial devices that can be used either to substitute for or to assist the pumping action of the human heart. He has performed more than, and this is another unbelievable number, more than 1,100 heart transplants and implanted hundreds of left ventricular assist devices, more than any other surgeon in the world. He completed his specialty training in general surgency under Dr. Michael E. DeBakey at Baylor Affiliated Hospitals and a residency in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery under Dr. Denton A. Cooley at the Texas Heart Institute. And with all of that, please join me in welcoming these very distinguished guests. So, yes, I was, want to extend my thanks also. Uh, this is the last program of uh, five, and everyone who's come, thank you so much for making them a success. And it's, I feel really lucky to have the support that uh, Joseph mentioned, and uh, I, hope, I hope the show is worthy of, of uh, the Manila and the Mitchells' support. So, thank you. I'm so glad to introduce our guest. Uh, we'll get to talk to them a little more in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to just share a brief story with you about the chain of events that partly made tonight possible. And I've always had an active imagination, uh, which was a large part fueled by the eccentricities of my grandmother. And one tradition she had started with me when I was a little boy was she would cut out and save uh, clippings from the comics that she thought I would like. In particular, uh, or the ones that I was always drawn to the most, were the Guinness Book World Records or Ripley's Believe It or Not. Entries that told uh, a picture, made a picture of the world that was filled with wonder and mystery. Uh, and some of my all-time favorite stories that she saved for me were about mothers who, in a rage of love, their hearts on the verge of breaking, ex who would exert superhuman strength to lift cars off their trapped children or the man who had been struck by lightning seven times in his life, testing all boundaries uh, of the body and the mind's plausibility of, of uh, its endurance, only to end up taking his own life with a shotgun over a failed love affair. And I think growing up in a household almost exclusively listening to country and Western music made me very sensitive to these types of stories. Um, <laughs> especially narratives that told stories about the heart that described it as somehow both the strongest and the most fragile vessel in our body. But even with this early schooling about the mysteries of the heart, nothing quite prepared me for when my grandmother handed me an entry describing this heart. The famous Leota Cooley heart. This is the first man-made mechanical heart ever implanted in a human and which occurred just miles from where we're sitting tonight. 
And I remember being so shocked when I read this. I could not believe that somebody would, could actually build a heart from scratch and expect it to work. And I also remember thinking to myself that Patsy Cline and Tammy Wynette, singing about wanting to mend their broken hearts, took on a new hope of possibilities with this invention. <laughs> and many years later, when I was given the opportunity to study at the Smithsonian Museum of American History as an artist research fellow, I was thrilled to discover that one of the prized objects in their collection, in fact, was the Lieto Cooley heart. It's a rare opportunity in life, of course, to come face to face with an object that once fueled the most magical parts of your childhood imagination. And I immediately knew when I saw it that I would commit to this heart as long as it took to understand its mysteries. And one day I was able to sit alone with the heart in a back room archive at the Smithsonian. And as I reflected on this incredible history that led to this object, a history one could argue started untold millennia ago, the very first time a human became self-aware that their heart was intimately linked with life and death. It became very clear to me why I have always felt so strongly about this object and this story. The artificial heart is a work of art. As an artist, I'm very sensitive to the way process, materials, and meaning interact to form new experiences in the world. And when you consider the incredible ingenuity, the complexity of design, the material innovation, and the fact that their specific function in the world is to save and extend life, the most meaningful gesture we can give to one another, then it's hard to, not arg to argue that these are not works of art and the, their inventors are not great artists. And I would be reminded of this once again several months later when I first had the opportunity to meet Dr. Frazier and Dr. Cohen. Dr. Frazier being incredibly generous and patient with a pesky, curious artist uh, invited me to observe one of his heart transplant surgeries. I, of course, quickly took him up on this offer. I knew what a rare and special gift it would be to give an artist the opportunity to ponder the divide between hearing a lifetime of songs about broken hearts and actually seeing a broken heart held in someone's hand. The gulf between the metaphorical and the literal never seemed so deep to me. As I stood there in awe of what I was witnessing, I knew I needed to understand this moment as deeply as I could and what could art say about such a thing? A moment that's really lost none of its primal strangeness, this literal exchanging of hearts. For most of recorded history, though, mystical and religious conceptions of the heart have dictated the cultural and artistic depictions of it. And many of these ideas hold strong to this day, but it is the scientific investigation of the heart in more modern times that now dominates our evolving conceptions of it. And these evolving conceptions matter deeply because when you change the conception of the heart, you are altering the symbolic lens through which most cultures throughout time have used to understand themselves. And here are just a few milestones that not only reshape the scientific understanding of the heart, but also changed our culture with their implications. Someone like William Harvey, who was the first to accurately describe the circulation of the blood through the body by a beating heart. Or Rene Descartes, who would, was the first to argue that the soul was not in the heart, but rather in the brain. Rene Lenec, the first to open up a brand new sound uh, scape of the heart, a sonic landscape of the heart, something we kind of take for granted today that we had have, have access to. Or E.J. Murray, who was the first to prove that a beating heart could be visualized and recorded outside of the body without cutting into, into a person. Augustus Waller, who was the first to record the electrical signatures of the heart, a very controversial radical idea at the time to suggest electricity had anything to do with the heart. And finally, in 1967, the first heart -to -heart, uh, I mean, human to human transplant of a heart. This may seem an overreaching thing to say, but think for a moment what these scientific milestones of the heart have done to complicate and upend some of the deepest questions we can ask one another, and which were usually answered using religious or mystical logics. Is there a physical location in the body 
for the consciousness, emotions, identity, what some may call the soul. What is the nature of free will if your heart is not your own? Even the legal definition of death has had to change as knowledge of the heart has grown. History has shown over and over again that when science changes our understanding of the heart, philosophy, art, and our spiritual understanding of the heart must change with it, either as arguments against these changes or to create new metaphors to embrace them. And this history continues to today. The artificial heart that Dr. Frazier and Dr. Cohen have developed and will speak to in more detail, I would argue is another turning point in this history and the artists, philosophers, and writers of our time will have to grapple with implications for many years to come. But we absolutely should be doing this together. In our age of increasing specialization, it seems less and less obvious sometimes how and why different fields should be in conversation. But a story as big as the quest to build a mechanical heart and the cultural changes that come with it is a story that requires thinkers from every field, which is why I'm so thrilled we have Mimi Swartz, one of our nation's best investigative journalists and writers with us tonight to, her, to speak to her research around the story. The dialogue I've had with her has been invaluable in conceiving this show and program, and, I, and we will be speaking to that more later this evening. But this is what is so magical about the heart. It inspires everyone. Scientists, artists, journalists, priests, or poets, the list goes on and on. But one of the most startling things I have discovered is that everyone on this list would argue the story starts at different places, or that one of us is over-romanticizing, or on the other hand, overlooking where the real heart of the story lies. But the heart has consistently shown there is room for all these interpretations, and it is in fact the creative tension between them that reveals the real complexity of this most enduring symbol and organ. So please help me in welcoming our guests tonight, Mimi Swartz, Dr. Frazier, and Dr. Cohen. videotaping, so forgive me if it's too loud. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what we're going to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes is give you a, a talk that's a hodgepodge of multiple elements. I'm going to stand up so I can turn around and see the slides, and I've also had way too much coffee. Uh, but we're going to describe, first of all, what's happened over the last three or four decades. And a lot of this work Bud did at the Texas Heart Institute really created the foundation of this field. And then we're going to describe what the two of us have done together over the last decade, tell you where things are now, and give you a glimpse of where things are headed. Uh, and we think, like Dario said, that the artificial heart is a work of art, and we want to share with you some of the creative process in envisioning uh, this new imagined heart and actually in creating it and in, in, in testing prototypes. But before I start talking about that, I wanted to say a few things about the history of manned aviation, because there's some wonderful parallels. When scientists first started trying to develop heavier-than-air flight, the first thing they did is looked at Mother Nature and tried to copy it. And the first designs all leveraged large flapping wings and a mechanism to do that, and none of them worked. It was only once scientists looked beyond trying to copy Mother Nature and developed the fixed wing and the rapidly spinning propeller that heavier-than-air flight became a practical reality for man. Trying to copy Mother Nature was short-sighted. There are no birds, there are no flying mammals, there are no insects that have a propeller, a jet engine, or a rocket motor, but those are great ways to fly. And that's sort of what we're trying to do now to reimagine the heart. Instead of a device that fills and ejects, fills and ejects, like all of your hearts do, to use rapidly spinning turbines. And we're gonna talk about that, but first, a quick summary about heart disease. I think everybody here knows heart disease is a big deal. It's a leading cause of death across every demographic, men and women in every country. Uh, one type of heart disease is called heart failure, where the main pumping chamber of the left side of the heart, the heart is two pumps, 
gradually fails. There are about a million deaths from heart failure every year in the world, 400,000 of them in the United States. And if you look at people over the age of 75 in the United States, about one in 10 has heart failure. And we spend $40 billion a year or more in the United States alone treating heart failure. So why don't we just cut out all these bad hearts and replace them with good hearts and transplant them? Well, I think you know we don't have the hearts for it. Uh, to have a heart that's useful for transplant, a very healthy person has to have brain death. You have to die in a very specific and tragic way. And in the United States, the busiest year, we did 2,200 of them, 4,500 in the whole world. So about 2,000 hearts a year and 400,000 people that die of heart failure in the United States. There is a real need to develop new therapies. Uh, to, to salvage these patients. And Houston has played a pivotal role in this development. How many of you know that the Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center on planet Earth? It is, and largely because of efforts in this area and largely because of the efforts of this man, Michael DeBakey. Uh, Dr. DeBakey had the uh, fourth, foresight to bring in this man, Domingo Loyota, South American, who was working on that heart that Dario showed you. It was a big uh, device, two, two sacks because the heart's two pumps, one that took venous blood and pumped it to the lung, another one that took the red blood returning from the lungs and pumped it to the body. It uses compressed air going in and out of two hoses. And uh, he was working in the lab with Domingo Loyota and had done cows, the longest cow had survived about seven hours. And Domingo Loyota was frustrated. He went to Dr. Cooley, then DeBakey's associate. And while DeBakey was out of town, Dr. Cooley implanted it in the first uh, human being. And Dr. Cooley was not too jazzed, uh, Dr. DeBakey was not too jazzed about that and created a 40 year feud that in many ways fueled the tremendous growth of the medical center, having two titans across the street from each other competing. Now, partly because of this our original episode and partly because of some of the perceived difficulties with an artificial heart, uh, Dr. DeBakey refocused his efforts to not developing an artificial heart, but developing a pump that would assist the failing heart. It would sit in the chest or in the belly next to the failing heart and would provide some of the work. And Bud, you were a medical student under DeBakey and you spent a lot of time uh, working on this. Uh, tell us about that. What, what inspired well, you? Well, we actually, uh, we began working on the left ventricular assist device uh, contemporaneously with the artificial heart. I would like to point out since this is a uh, an art gallery that uh, I uh, had no interest in science. I was a history major, and I had, when I graduated, I realized I couldn't stay in school forever, and uh, that girls liked the idea of a pre-med. So <laughs> I took uh, science courses and went to medical school without any idea what I was going to do. I and and uh, Billy's a musician, by the way. The, the other uh, thing that determined what I was going to do is Dr. DeBakey did require uh, every student to do a year of research every year. And by simple chance, I always waited to the last minute to do anything. And uh, we, our first year we had to let them know by the first of November what we were going to do. Uh, for our research project, and I was, uh, I remember it was the 30th of October, and I was standing by the uh, elevator in the Jewish research building, and a friend of mine who was a medical school a classmate and a fraternity brother who was a real gunner, he was one of the typical medicals, came up to me and he said, Bud, what are you going to do for your research? And I said, it was October the 30th, we had to know we went first, so I had another day. I said, well, I don't know, I hadn't decided yet. I've got another day. And he said, I knew you wouldn't have done anything. I've already written up a project. We're going to work in uh, transplantation in, in surgery with, uh, with Dr. DeBakey's uh, program. And that's how I got into transplantation. <laughs> that's how I got into this whole field, you know. So people say, well, you dreamed of this all your life, you know. And I just happened to be standing by the elevator when this friend of mine <laughs> came up and he needed another person. He knew he, he couldn't do it himself. Everybody wanted to be a heart surgeon then. He unfortunately had an a intentional tremor. And 
So I ended up doing all the surgery and I stayed with the project and I actually worked with Domingo Leota in uh, my second year on this project. And it was uh, quite an interesting project. I always remember one of the things that inspired me to some degree is we operated on this young Italian boy. He was a nice young boy, 18 years old, strong and healthy looking boy who was here from Italy uh, with his mother. We d did more Italians in all of Italy uh, at, at our center at that time. And I uh, uh, talked to him the night before his surgery. He was going to have his valve replaced. He was very hopeful he was going to go back go back to work. He had rheumatic valve disease. His mother was there. She couldn't speak English. And I scrubbed on the case the next day, and uh, he looked good. Dr. Vecchi did the valve replacement, and then his heart that evening stopped. And we opened his chest, and I remember massaging his heart. As long as I massaged his heart, he was fine. I was the youngest the medical student, so I massaged the heart with my hand. And uh, he actually looked up at me. Uh, I always remember that, it's sort of unnerving. And Dr. DeBakey came in and he said, quit, you know. So, but I wouldn't quit, of course, 25 years old. And uh, the resident came and finally knocked me off. And uh, I, I thought, you know, that kid was awake and looking at me. And if my hand could keep him alive, why couldn't we develop a pump that would keep them alive? And that was one of the other reasons I got into this field. Now, we worked on this pump through the, uh, 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 through the early days, and we actually, Dr. Bakey had the first successful patient with an ELVAD in 1966. I don't know what, what the next slide so, is. So derivative of that experience and that initial work, this is the pump that Dr. Frazier developed in the Texas Heart Institute lab, implanted the first 25 of them before anybody else in the world had implanted any. And this was a, a, actually a more advanced version, but the, this is typical for these pumps. It sat actually in the abdomen. Here is the failing heart. You don't take the heart out. And a tube connects the failing chamber uh, of the heart to this prosthetic chamber that beats back and forth. The idea is blood would fill in here and this blue uh, piston would go back and forth when compressed air was in, uh, brought in and out from an external compressor. And as the compressor went back and forth with one-way valves, it would shuttle blood from the failing heart into the circulation. But look at that, it has to do it once a second, which is about 86,000 times a day, which is 31 million times a year. There's no man-made device that can do that year after year. Still, a lot of lives were saved with this device. So blood would come in through this hose from the heart, through this one-way valve into this canister, which would compress, driving it through here and back to the circulation. But it was a big device, and these were very sick patients. So the operation to put it in was quite large, and many of the patients wouldn't survive the procedure. But more damning was the cyclic endurance. This was one that actually had a motor in it. 31 million cycles a year. It would last maybe a year or two, and then it would break. So it was best used for maintaining patients until they could get a transplant. It did prevent premature death. You could take someone gravely ill and put this device in, and then they would do well after rehabilitating, but then they had a year or two to get a transplant before the device would fail. Uh, lasted only about two years on the outside. So it didn't save more lives, it just changed which patients got those 2,000 heart transplants. Uh, but because it was so effective in salvaging patients, we knew that pumps were a good idea, we just needed a better one. And that's what this guy, Rich Wampler, a good friend of both of ours, was probably thinking while he was in Egypt doing missionary work, and he saw two Egyptian workers use an Archimedes screw to pump water up a river, up a river bank. And an Archimedes screw is basically a big spiral that when you turn it, can move water against gravity, almost like on an escalator. And uh, Rich Wampler reasoned that if it could use, pull, pull water against gravity, maybe it could move blood against pressure. So he came back and designed this, a little one about the size of a pencil eraser, and he reasoned that if he put it at the back of a tube and spun it fast enough, it could pull enough blood out of the failing heart to treat heart failure. 
Now, this was in the 1980s. There were no motors small enough or powerful enough to spin this as fast as it needed to go. There are now, but there weren't in the 80s. So he conceived of the idea of having the motor outside the body, strapped to the leg, with a spinning cable threaded up the leg artery under X-ray and the straw across the aortic valve. It was a weird device. No one had ever put a rapidly spinning anything inside a patient. And he showed it to you. What did you think of it? Well, I... I thought it would uh, tear up the blood, and I didn't think it would work. You know, one of our, our leaders, though, in medicine is a man named Claude Bernard, who was a great French physiologist in the uh, 19th century, and he pointed out that you, you should not never make a judgment whether something is going to be successful or be a failure before you do an experiment, but you should decide whether you should do the experiment or not and let nature tell you what the outcome will be. And hang your thinking cap on the wall when you go into the lab and let nature give you the answer. I'd been interested in continuous flow, again, from an early stage, because at the capillary level, that's where energy is exchanged, there is no pulsatility. The only organ that really needs a pulse is the heart, and it needs it not for the pumping it needs it because that's when the heart actually gets the blood and it became apparent to me in the 70s that this was going to have to be a uh, our only real approach to long-term pumps and uh, I would get in arguments at meetings and, and get in these uh, uh, debates over whether you needed a pulse or not nobody thought you needed a pulse I'm sorry, nobody thought that you, you could survive without a pulse. They thought the kidneys needed, the brain needed, the reflexes, et cetera. So all these guys, I would get in arguments. You know, uh, the, old, the old saying, uh, success has many fathers, failure is always a bastard. Now, I've, I've never had anybody question my role in this field because when I was doing this in the 80s, nobody else was interested in it. Rich Wampler did come to me after I gave a talk on this subject. I didn't know Rich Wampler. He came to me because I was the only physician involved with it. And the other doctor was Rob Jarvik. I knew Rob Jarvik. I never got along with him very well. He didn't like me. I didn't like him. And, uh, <laughs> but, but he knew that there was nobody else that was interested in continuous flow. And that's why we started, that's why they came to me. And we did the work in our lab at the Texas Heart Institute, the Cullen Cardiovascular Research Lab, which Billy hadn't pointed out. That was a huge resource that we had that nobody else had at this wonderful lab. And so you, you did cow experiments and well, it worked? Yeah, we, yeah, I'm sorry, back to the experiments. Yeah, we, we did that and I thought it would be like a wearing blender for blood or it could be. The, one of the problems was, uh, and one of the good fortunes, uh, he said, you know, this thing is spilling at 2,500 RPM. Oh, I said, 2,500 RPM, that's going to kill, but I thought that, I didn't say that. And that's what I thought uh, was uh, uh, going to be the chief limiting factor. But we put in animals, and it actually worked. And I, I'll always remember I gave a lecture on it uh, shortly after we'd uh, put it in the first patient and uh, had gone through the animals. And I said, you know, this is amazing technology. It spins at 2,500 RPMs, and it doesn't destroy the blood. And uh, Rich Walper, sort of a quiet, soft-spoken Indiana farm boy, pulled me over to the side after that talk and he said, you know, bud, it's really spinning at 25,000 RPM. You got it wrong. <laughs> and I said, good God, if I'd known that, I would have never done it, you know. So, so anyway, af after the animal experiments, you actually implanted it in, oops, sorry. This gentleman here, not that gentleman, this gentleman, uh, who was a gravely ill patient, had a heart transplant, his heart was failing, there was no other therapy for him. Uh, Dr. Frazier stuck that in under x-ray, turned it on, he went from blue to pink, and then uh, gave them several days to adjust the medications, the heart started beating again, and the device was removed. It was the first human being that had had a continuous spinning pump, and it was a huge departure from copying Mother Nature and a huge milestone in the field. Uh, subsequently, working with Rob Jarvik, they showed you could have spinning things on axles in the blood when they developed this, and that caused a huge explosion of technology in this area. These are all pumps currently under development uh, to assist the failing heart. And they're all subtly different, but they all have a spinning member on the inside, like 
the impeller on a jet ski or a boat propeller pushing blood through. It's actually a motor that spins an impeller. And uh, this particular device was first implanted by Bud at the Texas Heart Institute in November of 2003 in a 17-year-old boy. Subsequent to that, there have been 19,000 of these implanted worldwide, including in a former vice president. So it's literally changing the world. So look, you can see how much smaller these devices are much less mechanistic uh, complexity. Instead of flexing membranes and things actuating, it's one thing spinning. So not only are they smaller, they're much more durable. There are now several dozen patients that have had their devices for more than eight years. So this world literally has changed as a result of introduction to continuous flow. Now you're probably thinking, wow, great work, guys. These little pumps are really advancing. Uh, what's going on with the artificial heart? Well, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> because there's been significantly less progress in that area. This is the pulsatile pump that Dario showed, the Laota heart that Dr. Cooley implanted. It's been revised a, numerous, uh, a number of times, but it's still compressed air, inflating balloons, driving air out, beating 70 or 80 times a minute, 35 million times a year. Durability is still a huge problem. You have to be hooked to a giant compressor so it allows you life but it's, a, it's a, a modified life. This compressor now has gotten smaller. This was released last year. It only weighs 13 and a half pounds, but since it's ejecting 35 million times a year, you have to change it out every three months and it costs $100,000. So there is an opportunity to advance this field. So Bud, when I came down, said, oh, Billy, let's see if we can. Let's see if we can harness the benefits of these small pumps to make an artificial heart. And that's what we've been working on for the last decade. And as a first effort, we use this little pump and not knowing, you know, like Claude Bernard said, let nature answer your question. We cut out the heart of a calf and took two of these and put them in the atria. So this animal has no heart, just two turbines. One that you can't see pumping blood into the lungs and another one taking the bright red blood returning from the lungs and pumping it into the aorta. Here's an x-ray of that animal. The, the motion you see is the animal breathing. Two turbines, two rapidly spinning rotors, no heartbeat, no pulse, no EKG, and the patient doesn't seem to mind. Here he is eating grass, seeming, Tin Man, little uh, shout out to the Wizard of Oz, uh, seems for all the world like a normal animal. And we did this several times with a lot of these different pumps to the point where we were convinced we had something of value and utility, but each of these pumps was still in trials. And so if you wanted to use it, you had to use it according to the trial. The only one that was approved was this one. In medicine, if something's approved, you can use it however you want. So we thought, legally, we could implant two of these since it was no longer an investigational device. But we had to figure out a way to do it. How are we going to construct this? And here's where the artistic, uh, creative uh, component of the in inventive process. It's like any sculptor, sculptor would, would uh, think through a process. You, you had to get the desired result. We knew that it had to be blood compatible. It had to be smooth. There couldn't be any crevices. It had to be flexible enough that we could cut it and sew it in, but robust enough that it wouldn't suck down or kink. And we started thinking about how we were going to do that. And we went to medical device prototyping headquarters, the Home Depot. <laughs> and after a lot of failed starts, started evolving a technique that seemed to have utility. And there was no place we could look up how to do this, as no artist can. You develop a process, you iterate, you see what's good, what's bad, and continue to refine your process. And so what we started off with shapes, mandrels, of what we needed to do, and used pinata technology, basically building up a composite out of multiple materials to get behavior that no one material could provide. So we started off with these plastic cones, C-O-N-E cone. Uh, this is the case that a syringe comes out of. It happened to be the right size. I put it on top and filled in the gaps with Bondo. Bondo's what uh, auto detailers use to take out little dings. And then I wrapped it in masking tape and cut the masking tape out so I knew that this dress fit this mannequin. I then used this to trace on plastic to make a stencil. 
I then took my stencil and traced it on Dacron polyester, $9 for a square yard at the fabric store, cut them out, and I say I sewed these, I didn't, I took them to my dry cleaner, but sewed them along this line to make these conical dresses that fit perfectly over the little mandrel. I then wrapped it with multiple layers of drywall tape, the stuff you use to take out the seams in, in drywall on the interior of houses, and silicone from the bath and tile department. And by wrapping it made these structures that were flexible, they wouldn't suck down, they were Dacron polyester, the material that DeBakey told us was blood compatible and that all uh, cardiovascular prostheses are made out of. At one point, I thought I needed to make a little U-bend, so I made this little pegboard. I took a spring that was about as big as I needed, threaded a fabric tube over it, bent it in that configuration, wrapped it with drywall tape and fiberglass and made these little U's that I could mount into the things to make what we thought would be a suitable continuous floor artificial heart. And we kept experimenting and iterating in animals, all nice Dacron on the inside. We would cut the heart out completely, sew these conical things in, put the turbines on them. Oops. This thing's got a mind of its own. And there's an animal now, several months out, with no heartbeat, no pulse, no EKG, walking on a treadmill, eating molasses off a of bud in Dr. Cooley's hand. So based on this body of work, and this is over several years, we did this 50 or 60 times before saying, I think we have something that may be of use in a gravely ill patient. But we realized if we sewed drywall tape and silicon from Home Depot into a patient, we'd become much more familiar with the process by which license plates are made. <laughs> So then the challenge was to find things that were approved for medical use that would emulate these Home Depot products. And that's what we came up with. This is actually a hernia mesh for fixing groin hernias, very similar to drywall tape, except instead of $3 a roll, it's $2,000 a sheet. <laughs> Cardiovascular patches designed for repairing defects in the heart and great vessels, and medical silicone. Again, instead of $9 a yard, this is a $2,200 sheet. And with this, though, put together the world's first continuous flow artificial heart. We then waited uh, for the right opportunity. And Bud, if you could tell us about this patient well, this we did. This patient was a wonderful man that we uh, was dying of uh, a disease called amyloidosis. I always tell my medical students, it, never tell a patient that their disease is extremely rare because that's very little consolation to them since they're the one that, that has it. And this man, though, did have an extremely rare disease called amyloidosis, which pretty much uh, uh, prevented us from doing any of the conventional technologies for uh, reasons we can discuss later if you'd like. So this was the only thing that could save him. Now, we had to deal with the FDA, and nobody has dealt more with the FDA than myself. I've been dealing with them for nearly 30 years. And so I, uh, I, I knew how to do that, and, and we actually took the patient to, to the operating room, talked to his family. He'd been on life support for two weeks and was unconscious, but his family wanted us to do everything. And he uh, uh, actually uh, was, uh, uh, as I said, an engineer. And uh, you know, we knew you had some understanding of what we were doing. And we uh, took him to the operating room and uh, removed his diseased, non-functioning heart and replaced it with these two pumps with the idea that if we could get him through this, we would actually uh, go on and do a transplant, so as a bridge to transplant. And he awoke, he got off the breathing machine, he was able to visit with his family and work on his computer. Tragically, he was so gravely ill, his liver continued to fail, and by five and a half weeks, it failed to the point where he couldn't remain consciousness. During that period, we discovered he not only had the amyloid in his heart, liver, and kidneys, he also had it in his lungs, and we didn't have a solution for him, and the family asked that we turn the device off. It was very, very tragic, a very brave man, and a milestone in the development of the field. 
We now know that humans can be supported by continuous flow, and there are a non number of groups working on this now. And perhaps uh, a lot of neat things came out of this. We published a number of uh, publications. We got lay press attention in National Geographic and the cover of popular science. But the most important thing that came out of this is we met this man, Daniel Timms, who'd been working on a continuous flow artificial heart far more sophisticated than our efforts in Australia, and nobody would give the guy the time of day because they thought he was crazy. He introduced us himself to us, and like DeBakey with Domingo Loyota, we imported him. He's now at the Texas Heart Institute. He's been there for the last two years, and the device he's developing that's in his hand there, working with Bud and I in our lab, we feel very confident will be the first practical artificial heart, the first practical mechanical replacement for the failing heart, and it's been the most exciting uh, adventure I've ever been part of, and I think for you too, Bud, and, and the story's just being written now, and I can't wait to see what happens next. I know we went way over our time, Dario. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, look forward to the next phase of the uh, <laughs> event. I will say Billy's just waiting until I go out of town so he can put it in. <laughs> so, well, that was incredible. They make the case better than I did about the artistry of this. And, um, I wanted to dig into that more. It's a really rare opportunity to, to have them here in this context to talk about the intersection of art and science, especially when the science, as I said, is changing fundamental notions of what we thought we were. Uh, but before we dig into that a little more, I want to introduce Mimi Swartz again. And uh, our relationship has evolved in in very interesting, tremendous ways, and uh, as another example of how genres talking to each other across fields can, interesting things can happen. And Mimi, do, would you like to start out just maybe reviewing how, how you became interested in this topic? Well, I became interested in this topic thanks to Dario. Um, and a lot of people ask me, where do you get your ideas? And uh, my answer is always, you have to go everywhere and listen to everybody. And you still have to wait 10 years to get another decent idea. Um, and that's what happened this time. I was interviewing Dario for another story, and I really thought about canceling, and because uh, I had enough. And we went to lunch, and I'm sitting there talking to this guy, and he's we go off topic, as I often do, and he's telling me about this artificial project, artificial heart project that he's interested in, and he's been spending all this time at the Smithsonian. And I'm looking at Dario and I'm thinking, why is he going to the Smithsonian when the Texas Heart Institute is here? And uh, the fact is, Dario, like me, is from San Antonio, and you always go the hard way <laughs> to get to where you need to go. Um, so we started talking about what was going on in Houston, and I had been interested in, in Dr. Frazier and Cohn's work, but what Dario did for me in the space of about three minutes is to put them in a historical context. And by putting them in that context, it sort of gave me two books, which is this immediate look at what's going on now, what's going on most recently, plus this has been a holy grail of medicine for a very long time, and much of it happened here. So this is why I am now, I walked away from the lunch after waiting 10 years to look for a decent book idea, thinking, well, I'm done. I've got the idea now. So I am now eternally grateful to Billy. I mean, but Billy, Bud, and Dario. But, uh, and I'll never forget Dario. And Dr. Frazier, I, I don't know if you know this, but that was the morning you called then, me to, uh, I don't know, six in the morning to come watch your, your transplant. And I had already scheduled my meeting with Mimi that day, thinking, of course, I'm going to cancel. I want to go see a heart transplant. And, uh, but I went straight from watching you to the lunch with Mimi, 
and now three years later, here we are all sitting here. It's just it's in, it's amazing how these things can ripple out these strange ripple out effects. Because I went to the meeting with you, incredibly moved, as I mentioned, after what I had just witnessed you do. My my, my mind was still processing it all, and Mimi had to hear me. You know, I'm sure jumbled, kind of uh, sp uh, spewing it out. But if just to pick up a little more to dig into what you said, because I know when I, I uh, when I'm choosing a topic that I know is ultimately going to take years of my life, I, you, you have committed your lives uh, to the heart. Uh, but as a writer, just to give insight into all of us as creative people, who what it takes to commit years of, our, of your life to something. And I know it's an amazing story, but could you dig into more just your process in general of picking topics that are worthy of committing your life to? Well, again, after our lunch, it seemed very clear to me because having lived here for a very long time, I love writing about Houston, and this was fundamentally a Houston story. I think so much of this wouldn't have happened anywhere else. It's that entrepreneurial idea, which especially Billy and I have talked about, where if you listen to what Cooley and DeBakey did, during their early years, there were no constraints. And, and when Cooley was short of money, he'd go to some friend who'd just, you know, pull out his checkbook and write a check, you know, to fund another special project. It was, uh, it was a lot simpler. But, but this story, to me, had everything. It had drama. First of all, you don't know what's going to happen. And then it had a richness of character, all of these people who are devoting their lives to changing the lives of others. Um, and then it had Houston, and then it also, it's a story about modern medicine and a story about innovation and how, I think to me, I don't know if you all agree, but how much more difficult it is to innovate now for good and for ill. Yeah, is it a coincidence so much of the modern history of the heart has happened here in Houston? Uh, a coincidence? Yeah. I mean. Well, it, in a way it is, in a way it isn't. I think, you know, I've had the uh, good fortune to be involved with it more or less from the start. And it is uh, interesting to me how easily it could have gone one way or the other uh, throughout its history and how poorly it's sort of understood. Uh, so much of it was a, a a humanistic effort. It wasn't hard science we were dealing with. We were dealing with a humanistic goal and we were trying to work with it. And uh, it is uh, something that, that uh, it's, it's actually has been said recently that we've understood the immunology of transplantation so well now that if we had known all that when we started, we would have never done it. We would have thought it would be impossible. So I, I do think uh, it is a, uh, a product of Houston. Dr. DeBay couldn't have done what he did in New Orleans, Washington, D.C., Boston, anywhere in the country, I don't think, than Houston. That's my opinion, because in Houston, you could run as far as your legs would carry you. And uh, anybody who says they like Dr. DeBay, he never worked with him. <laughs> you know, he was like, you know, he was just as mean and tough as you can be. He would actually, as Billy said, he would hit you. He would, it wasn't like there was all this uh, human resources and concern about the student, you know. <laughs> He'd just beat you up. And, uh, but he built, he took Baylor from a third-rate medical school when he came here in the 40s to by the time I went, it was considered the best medical school in the South and, and still is a, a great school. So I don't think it could have been done anywhere else, actually. <laughs> I wanted to emphasize a point that you brought up in the talk. Uh, you know, I we talked about material innovation, uh, ingenuity, and design, which, as an object maker, I'm, I'm very sensitive to. And as I said, I can I, I feel like I can see the artistry on a on the making level. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very much driven by ideas. And could you dig in a little more? just to really emphasize what a conceptual leap it was uh, to suggest. Uh, One more. 
uh, just this, this beautiful analogy you've used about, which makes it very clear in the mind, that uh, you think it has to be one way because nature seemed to have solved it that way, and it turns out it doesn't have to be. But the, the, uh, the courage and uh, artistic uh, confidence to move forward on an idea, as you said, where everybody else thought it was crazy and wouldn't give, give you the support, and that's what I've always been drawn to, is the commitment to an idea, even when others are doubting it. And could you just give more framework about what, what a turning point this actually is? Yeah, I mean, huge. Uh, but that's the innovative process. And uh, innovation is a lot like fishing. You don't go, I didn't catch a fish. I give up. You cast over and over again. And I can tell you, for every good idea that's out there, there are scores, hundreds of bad ideas. And you can't be afraid to try things. And you try them in, a, in an environment where it's OK to fail. We don't sow them in animals. We certainly don't sow them in people until we've demonstrated that there's utility. Mm -hmm. So every pump that before it was tried, even in an animal, pumped blood on a bench. And we made observations. And then animal studies and gradually uh, human implementation. But for every thing that worked, there were a lot of things that don't work. And you just can't be afraid to experiment, just like you do in the artist studio or in the music studio. You try things, and if something sort of works, you focus on it and flesh it out. And that's what we've done uh, with the different patents and technologies I've developed. You know, it's that exact same process over and over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, Mimi, uh, a, qu a question you've consistently asked me in our discussions uh, has been, how do you make the heart a character mm -hmm. when you're as a writer, from a writer's point of view? And as an artist, I'm so fascinated in that process, especially, like, how do you, everything we're talking about tonight, like this angle, the innovation, or my concerns with the, art the artistic or philosophical implications mm -hmm. with the changes, how, how as a writer do you approach building the, the heart as a character? Well, I was going to ask you all this because I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this idea came from a friend of mine, and when she suggested it to me, she said it like, well, of course, the heart has to be a character. And I thought, yeah, of course. Um, so I wondered if you all had any thoughts on that. Do you, or is this just more of the personification of something that you don't think really is worth the time? I mean, it is. Are you allowed to change characters in the middle yes, of the story? Yes, you are. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Especially you know, where I am. Part of the yeah. Plan. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Well, well, the heart does have some characteristics that people have: indefatigability and resilience. Mm -hmm. And and I know we we all collectively lock the you know think about the heart being the the heart, the center of emotion. You know, the heart's mm -hmm. a muscle. No more emotional than your bicep. Mm -hmm. It beats faster when you're emotional, not as a source of emotion, but as a response to it, of circulating adrenaline. There's a lot of mysticism mm -hmm. about the heart, but it's really just a big hollow muscle. Well, I, I'm Hate not to disappoint you. <laughs> I was on Dateline once, and uh, Stone Phillips said, you're holding the heart. What's that like? And I said, a lot like the spleen, but it wiggles around a little. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, means. I think that's one of the things you've got to get out of your mind. You're dealing with it. Uh, yeah. As a physician, your, your goal is to cure disease and relieve suffering. Mm -hmm. And if it, an organ becomes ineffectual, then you have to address it. So it is a, a, a player, but that's just like human life is a player. Mm -hmm. it, it, you're, you're dealing with, with the uh, essence of of life, and it's uh, it's as important as the kidney and the liver and the other thing. But so, it is, uh, uh, I, I I think it's it's interesting to it, it plays a role just like the 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 patient plays a role. And I, I know I've asked you, and I I'm sorry if this annoys you sometimes, but but I well, I mean I as a scientist in me is so fascinated with that point, and. I know both of you have such uh, rich lives where artistry is, displays itself with music and your passion for literature. And I know you realize that you could argue most of art history is founded on the matters of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a notion of the heart 
that I know you've had to let go of long ago for reasons I completely get. So I'm curious when you, you know, when I come in with these types of questions, how does, is there any room in your thinking anymore for, for that? Knowing, knowing how passionate you are about art in other parts of your life. Well, I personally, when, when we're talking about that aspect of the heart, I uh, envision something in my head that is heart-like mm -hmm. because, you know, like you said, uh, emotion is all in the brain. Uh, I don't have any problem with that, but I don't, I, I don't uh, uh, accept the notion that it has anything to do with the contractility of myocardium accelerating the blood. Mm. I, yeah. I think we all have a, you know, I, I still think my old English sheepdog has a lot of heart. <laughs> I don't mean he's in congestive failure, I just mean, mean he's, you know, and my, my kids have a lot of heart, my wife has a lot of heart, Bud has a lot of heart. I'm, I'm not talking about their ability to accelerate blood. Right, yeah. But I do think when making the transition, because there is a transition, like in, yeah any field from when I was essentially a layman and I went into it, I think these emotional aspects certainly did play a role and uh, mm. I, you had to make that transition mm. uh, into, well, you've got to solve this problem. With the Italian boy mm -hmm. had to solve this problem. But does it interest you that what you do will have these ripple out effects culturally as a kind of argument? Does that just interest you at any level? Though? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, someday <laughs> people may say, you know, sing songs about the hum of the heart, you know? <laughs> I think the other organs should get together and hire better marketing. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I do think uh, the, the, a lot of the work that you've done is fascinating. I mean, it is fascinating. It's something we all know, but just to listen to these hearts that were beating a century ago reminds us, uh, of course, as was it, Lucretia said, our bodies are on loan, you know. We don't own our bodies, we, they're on loan. We crawled out of the mud uh, a million years ago, as I said, we're merely finite representations of an infinite process. And I think that sort of really brings it home uh, to me and I think to, to anyone. If I could point out Two, the two things that impacted me so deeply watching you both work, um, and uh, we, we can even play, play some of the sound. You know I've been so interested in the sound. Uh, but now getting to watch you both work, uh, again, as an artist looking at it as it's happening, there are two things that really stood out, uh, being very sensitive to spatial issues and also to sound. And the moment you remove the heart, the gap in the chest, that, that emptiness startled me so much. It, I realized that this is a space on the planet that would never exist unless we created it to happen. And I remember, if, you know, maybe I was a little, uh, I don't know, not hallucinating, but I felt like the room was in a sense orbiting around the most densely empty space I've ever seen in my life as an artist. And I'm still pondering the philosophical implications of that emptiness. So just on a, on a sculptural level, that gap. And I, I would so interested the first time you saw it. I know you've seen it so many times now, but, but did it have some impact for you the first time you yeah, saw it? I, I felt just like uh, you're describing it now. And the only other time I felt that experience is I had an old English car, sports car, and I took it to New Hampshire when I lived in Boston. And I went to visit it, and he'd taken the, the engine out. Oh. And seriously. And the engine bay was empty, and the engine was taken apart all around his shop. And I nodded, and he was telling me what he was going to do, and I wasn't even hearing his words. I said, this car will never roll again. Because I thought, there's no possible way he could assemble that. And you get the same sort of feeling. You see an empty chest lying there with a bunch of people around. You go, well, what have we done here? This man is doomed. And to see them sitting up in bed the next day, hugging a pillow, trying to cough with vital signs and pink in their cheeks and talking to their family members, it's very surreal. And I've seen it hundreds of times, and it's still surreal. It, it does. It's yeah, still I mean, Well, I think that's obvious. That's the first thing. It's, it's like I said, making that transition, when you see that, uh, it is uh, uh, quite an emotional experience. Is the heart going to beat again? Will it? How does it remember how to beat? It remembers how to beat somehow. It's been out on a, 
in a seven in an in a, cooler, in a for, four hours. cooler you know? for three hours. And uh, and Dr. Cooley is really the uh, and unquestionably, and nobody will argue this, that knows heart surgery was the best technical heart surgeon that uh, will really ever live. Uh, still describes that, that when he did the first successful heart transplant in America, that that was the most uh, 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 emotional experience he had in, in, in all his medical career was when he took that heart out of that first patient and, uh, and, and planted it, the heart, and it, and it worked. Because it's really interesting, the heart, and when it's taken out of the donor, you flush all the blood out of it, so it looks like something literally from your grocer's freezer. You put it in a baggie with some ice, put that baggie in a baggie with ice, put that in a third baggie, and put it in a cooler, and it can be coming from a two-hour flight away. And they come in, and you sew it in, and it really doesn't look like it's ever going to be animate, but there's a clamp preventing blood from getting to it. And you take the clamp off, and blood runs down the arteries, and suddenly it starts to look a little bit more like a heart, and then... Whoa, whoa. And it's, it's very surreal. Well, to follow that, the other thing, the, the spatial issue, but it was also the sounds, the sounds in the room. Uh, it also occurred to me that the devices you're creating are creating a new sound portrait of life that at first here seems as if this is the most mechanical, inhuman sound you could make, but it's actually this beautiful soundtrack of the quest to save an extinct life. And you've been so generous in my uh, desire to hear them and record them. I thought I'd love to play just two of them and hear them through, through your point of view, some things you're picking up on. I can name that heart in two notes. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't, I don't know the patients. So. Okay. Yeah. So it was a mm -hmm. single heart main tube on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially as a musician, like, uh, do do any of your the the ear you've you've uh, trained as a musician over the years? What do you hear? I, I've never heard it that loud. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. As we were talking about earlier, they're harmonics. You can hear it's sort of a chord, and it sounds yeah. in tune. You know, with a car motor, you can hear and go, boy, it's purring. Or when something's wrong, you hear something's wrong. So listening, you showed Lynette with his stethoscope, has been so important in diagnosing problems with the heart. But now in the modern era, we order an MRI, an echo, this, that. We can actually look on our computer screen, and it's sort of a lost art. In fact. Bud, you're one of the last people I've seen who actually carries a stethoscope. <laughs> but it's so essential. And all these devices have an acoustic signature, and that's one of the ways. That first one was the <laughs> that beats once a second, the one that only lasts a year and a half or so. One of the ways we would diagnose problems with that pump and impending failure was it would start to sound weird. And I imagine that sound you just played, the second one, which is the rapidly spinning Heartmate 2, and the change you hear is a change in rotational speed, increasing the efficiency and pumping capacity. That's, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful sound. And I imagine in the next generation, we will associate that with health. 
purring along with your beautifully tuned artificial art. We, uh, uh, you know, when we started putting these postal pumps in, I put the first one in 1986, and we were concerned because it makes a noise like that, and it would be worrisome to the patients. But in point of fact, we were using it as a bridge to transplant. Frequently, after the transplant, the patients would want a recording of the noise they'd gotten so used to it that they couldn't sleep unless they heard that Without their device. bump, bump, oh, yeah. bump in the pad. The, the other interesting aspect of this, uh, and my son has is, is, uh, pointed this out, you know, there, I don't really understand it. He's a musician, and of course, he has a good fortune of being in a field that his father knows absolutely nothing about. And, uh, but uh, we frequently put in two pumps for both sides of the heart. Not frequently, but my son has pointed out that the harmonics, you know, there's, there's a certain harmonic uh, uh, imprint of nature that uh, he understands, but I'm not sure I do. But uh, we're doing experiments now to see if they're in proper harmonic, the two sides of the heart, that uh, they'll, they'll be more effective. And it, it uh, will be a fascinating experiment that we're doing now. It's interesting, all the implants that we use, a lot of them, I should say, have an acoustic signature. Uh, heart valves, 70 or 80,000 of those are implanted every year in the United States, and many of the mechanical ones make a little sound like this. And the, none of you can hear your heart right now, right? Why is that? Your brain has learned to filter it out. We put this new element in, and the patient says, hey, I can hear this clicking when my heart beats, and you say, that's great. Call me right away if that stops. You know. <laughs> so the sonic, the sonic aspects of heart technology is a whole new field and continue to evolve. And, and like I said, that HeartMate 2 sound, the sound of continuously purring, whirring pump, I think it's going to become an increasing part of our world and our culture. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects that was interesting to me, I, gave, I was in Kazakhstan, of all places, about a year ago, giving a lecture in Kazakhstan, and uh, it, um, which is actually a, a very modern city. And they had implanted uh, 180 of these LVADs in Kazakhstan that developed around my desk. And uh, there are two different ones, but they both developed and, you know, and, and uh, started in my office in Houston. And I thought, you know, that's one of the remarkable things to realize and they're only implanted to save lives so that uh, it's impacted lives in Kazakhstan something that started in Houston I'm, I'm not sure people in Houston appreciate mm -hmm. all the work that's uh, that's been uh, done in our medical center mm -hmm. that, that would have been impossible I think in most places mm -hmm. yeah Mimi you know something working with you um, has been as an artist working with a great journalist, investigative journalist, uh, has been so rewarding to me, especially making me realize I can get a lot better, especially at first-hand accounts uh, of people who, have, who are having these experiences. And one that I know you and I have talked about is related to the sound, is something I picked up in one of the interviews with Mrs. Lewis after the surgery and that she put her ear on, on, the, on Craig's chest to, and heard that. And does, I, you know, how do you, what is your, because as a writer, you have to find those moments. Uh, that as fascinating as the technology is, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but as a writer, maybe this is something you're looking for, those moments when the wife's well, ear hit the chest. Well, what I'm, when you ask me that, what I'm thinking of is Dario sent me an email the other day saying, you know, well, when Mrs. Lewis put her head on her husband's chest and, you know, she was wondering without the heartbeat if he really could love her anymore. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, you know, because I have, I think Dario is actually a great journalist, but I, I thought, how did I miss that? And so I emailed him back and I said, Dario, where did that come from? And he said, well, it was just my thinking about what I hoped 
or thought might happen. And that's the difference, where I can't put something, I now have to go to Mrs. Lewis and ask the horrible right. question, yeah. um, which you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I thought about when we were talking about sounds is, you know, all of these sounds have become smaller. I mean, when Barney Clark, I don't know how many of you remember, it was 82, right? When Jarvik put, when Dr. DeVries put the Jarvik heart in Barney Clark, he was in a room with a machine. How big do you think it was? The compressor? Bigger than this. Uh, yeah, it's huge. Big blue. Yeah, yeah and, it, and the sound, table. the sound was enormous. It was so loud that it was one of the reasons that he finally, you know, was begging them to let him go because it just, he couldn't live with it. And, and I think these people who have allowed themselves to become almost human experiments, I mean, I think we have to keep in mind what they've been through. It's just very interesting to think of the changes thanks to them in a lot of ways. Yes, that's why I feel we need all of us when these mm -hmm. things happen uh, to, to flesh out those aspects of the story that as I'm arguing, who knows the ripple out effects just conceptually and how it will start to change, change art and um, literature and, and philosophy to, to let go of a, what was assumed was an untouchable defining feature of a, as a beating heart. And that's what I'm so fascinated in how we move forward thinking about this together. You know, one other uh, potential effect of this technology that I kind of say tongue in cheek, and we, uh, the new device, the one that we haven't talked about, the one that Daniel Timms is working on, will pump 23 liters a minute. That's probably four times more than most of your hearts are beating right now. So it's quite possible that these devices will allow superhuman performance. Mm -hmm. And I always joke that at the 2200 Olympics, there's going to be <laughs> stock and modified. You know? <laughs> and, and, and it sounds crazy, but I guarantee the Wright brothers never envisioned there'd be 18,000 domestic flights a day mm -hmm. with 300 people watching Die Hard 2 eating really bad <laughs> cheeseburgers flying from LA to New York. Mm -hmm. And you know, our imagination always lets us down. You watch science fiction from the 50s and 60s, there is nothing they describe anywhere near as cool as this, yeah. right? So, you never know. Well, we, I, we can take a few questions if you like. Yep. I'm trying to put together what you said, and the title of your exhibit was, uh, The Boundary of Life, Across. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And also, what you have your artwork at the, the handout that we got? Yes. Mimi, do you have one of these with you? Do I? Do you have one of these? Yeah. yeah. I'd like Mimi to respond to your artwork, Dario. And then, Dario, I'd like to tell us what, you, what went into this artwork. <laughs> the one on it. the cover? Yes, the one on the cover, since we all have it. Because I like to get to your artwork. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what was the wanna, question again? <laughs> the, well, I don't want to put Mimi on the spot. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm assuming she likes my work. So. Yes, I uh, do. But uh, Mimi, I just want you to respond to what you see. Yeah. Okay. To That's, this particular. Yes, one? that particular one. Well, she may not know some of the backstory to that. So I'll. Yeah. Uh, do you have one? It, well, yeah. Uh, show, show Dr. Cohen. Well, to me, this is, tries to encapsulate everything going on at this table, which is uh, mm -hmm. when the heart, when the pulse was first uh, able to be recorded by science, which is kind of a forgotten milestone, the idea of imaging a beating heart without cutting into someone was a true breakthrough. And something I found that uh, intrigued me was that the scientists of the time who were on the threshold of a divide that that you are uh, you know, clearly, clearly over as far as are there any hints of emotion still in there? But a lot of those early tests with those, the tracings were done on people in emotional states because it was just a new technology. Nobody had seen the heart when somebody had, had eaten chocolate, let alone fallen in love. So it was <laughs> this brand new thing to look at the heart as an image, uh, a beautiful mark being traced in soot. That particular image 
I found very fascinating because it was an early study on twins. And the idea was, if they both had the same emotional stimulus, would their pulses be reflected in the, the same as a tracing? Oh, wow. So that, to me, is a, that's what I think Mimi and I bring to the table, are you can have hard science, acknowledge what a turning point in history this, that image is, the, the pulse tracing, it, it's on the left side of the image, and then you have the two twins. History's forgotten who they were, but did their hearts beat in sync? You know, that was the thing they were curious about. Mm. And then I've elaborated cool. on the idea of, in the Victorian tradition, uh, giving someone a memento, a locket of hair, or a daguerreotype, uh, or, or a letter, or a flower stuck between the pages of a letter, uh, that I was imagining in my head, this new technology allowed a new form of intimacy in the world. Could you give your partner an image of your heart as a line on the page? So it was me extrapolating on the idea of, for the first time, trading images of our hearts. In this case, their hearts be beating together. So that's what they're looking at. And that's why I think we need all of us. I could never have found that story if I hadn't gotten better at researching through Mimi. I never would have been looking for those tracings if I hadn't been so deeply moved by Dr. Fraser and Dr. Cohen. Uh, so yeah, that's my, my argument, is we all need to be working on this. <laughs> but I would also say that it stands as a work of art on its own without knowing any of that. I think, to me, Daria walked me through the show uh, before it opened, but or right after it had opened, but I think all of his work you can bring to it what you bring to it. I don't think everyone needs him walking them no, through because, I yeah. I just, I thought that, I just love the electricity of it. I love the, I love the colors. I'm, I'm thinking more of the giant piece of work in there because that's the one I responded to the most. But I thought he had created a world there in the way that the best journalists or the best novelists also create worlds that you can fall into with your own history. Um, does that? I'm gonna take, yeah, a few more questions. Yeah. Just uh, one observation. Uh, oh, sorry. The continuous flow that product and we put it in patients in the 1980s but yet you weren't able to bring it forward and, and have it revolutionize all of this uh, re heart replacement technology until almost 30 years later so what I wonder is if the technology then was so far ahead of time that technology itself medical science had to catch up to be able to let you use these devices, maybe what Dario's working with now is, okay, now we've got the devices, how do we catch up emotionally to the idea that we can all exist with or without a heart or a heartbeat? Well, I, it, it didn't move forward because, was it St. Augustine says, we, we try to strive to live in the city of God, but we must live in the city of man. We were in the city of man and uh, the FDA wanted to do, us to do another test. It was the first device to ever to go, medical uh, support device to go to the FDA. And uh, they wanted to do more. And the guys that were financing it decided to invest in a racehorse. And, <laughs> and, the, and that's what uh, stopped that technology, which was uh, a tragic thing. I think it, it would have moved forward a lot more rapidly. But, uh, but it is, I, I think one of the things, you know, medicine is not a science. Anybody, I can sit and beat anybody down that tries to, to sell that. It's an applied art, and it's a metaphysical need of man, and we always take care of the sick. You know, any, any primitive tribe will have uh, some form of music, they'll have some form of art, they'll have some form of study storytelling and they'll have a medicine man and uh, we always take care of the sick and it may not make any sense but does it make any sense you know we reproduce we grow anyway and uh, but it's it's something we can't get away from and I think what we do 
is for the patients, you know, ultimately, you know, for the Italian boy or whoever it is to try to, to uh, help the sick and, and, uh, and address these, these uh, human problems. And we later may understand it. It may be a science, you know. It took 20, 30 years before we actually understood how penicillin worked, but we still gave it, you know. And similarly with transplants. Uh, I have a question back here. Uh, <clears throat> in your intro, uh, you were showing a picture of the Leota um, Cooley. Cooley heart. Mm -hmm. And for me, the form looked very much like a set of uh, headphones. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there was any connection for you with that, if that had ever popped up, mm -hmm. since you were so influenced yeah. by music and sound. Yeah, not, not in the form. Not a, you're right, though. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that till right now. <laughs> cool. The headphone connection. But I was always curious what it sounded like. And one of the, you know, it's not sad, but I don't know that any audio recording was ever made of that heart. So that's, that's a moment in sound history that's gone forever. And I feel like just as an interesting way to tell the narrative of the history that you're working on is a portrait of sound. And I wish the archive had been kept of those sounds over time. Well, I, I do too. Of course, it's a shame. And uh, it, it uh, of course, in, in that instant, they were just so amazed in many ways that the patient did well. You saw the patient awake with his, his wife next to him. That was a day after the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, we never do that today. We're, we still haven't been able to take a patient the day after surgery with a total artificial heart and have them awake and mm. drinking water and that sort of thing. It was, a, again, it was, it was Dr. Cooley was so slick. One of the reasons he was so quick on the, in, in, in doing the surgery that uh, it was, uh, and also that is, it goes back to the art form. I mean, I, I used to think everybody could be trained to be a, a, a good surgeon if they, uh, you know, just had the proper training. And, but I didn't realize until I got through with Dr. Debakey's training system that he'd already fired the ones he didn't think would be good <laughs> surgeons. So th there, there, there is a, 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 a certain aspect of it, but Dr. Cooley was probably one of the few people in the world that could have put that pump in, mm. technically. Nobody really knew how to do it at that time. And uh, Dr. Debakey, God bless him, I don't think, would have tried it ever. Uh, that, that was why Leota went over to Cooley because he knew Dr. Bakey would never uh, try it. But uh, it, it is, uh, was a very important uh, accomplishment to show that you, you could have a patient like that with a purely mechanical heart. But the sound wasn't so important. It probably wasn't, no. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah, the, the, the total hearts were really offensive in that, from an auditory standpoint, let's say, the early ones. Um, Maybe, did you? I have a question for you that uh, when I was talking about innovation when I first started answering questions, and I just wondered whether you thought, is it harder now to innovate? To innovate, is it the same? Do you think? I think it's easier to innovate. Okay, tell me and I was going to say, I was going to yeah. raise that point, because the tools that are readily available mm -hmm. to anybody who wants to innovate. Instead of having to get engineers and stuff, I can take my laptop and with solid works on an airplane, create something. I can email it to the lab. They can print it out on the 3D printer. Mm -hmm. I can take it and mess with it later that day. We have the internet. I need a neodymium iron boron magnet that's 42 <laughs> million gauss orsted and three quarters of an inch. Shows up in the mail three days later. The world has changed so much and the more you know, the more you can figure out. And you, you said the thing about how easy it was to get money. When we wanted to bring Daniel Timms here to, to, to bring this device, and I was hoping we could take a quick look at that device. It's got one moving part floating in a magnetic field. There's no mechanical wear, there's no bearings, and 20,000 times a second, it subtly adjusts its position to accommodate the physiology. When we wanted to bring him here and his whole team, he said he could come for a year if we got two and a half million dollars together. 
I went and talked to Mattress Mac. A week later, he got out his checkbook and wrote us the check. So I don't know if you can do that anywhere other than Houston, but you can <laughs> sure do it here. It's in the culture, it's in the, it's in the mortar, it's in the air. This is an innovative town, and heart surgery and space program are two of the things that got it, and petroleum. And uh, so, you know, and I think it's easy to innovate in Houston, Texas. Okay. But I have one more question. Yes. <laughs> but when I went to, uh, to a medical convention with both of you, everything the doctors, many of the doctors there were complaining about, oh, the FDA, this will never get it through the FDA. But, so when Cooley wanted to do something, he just did it. Do you think that now, were they all exaggerating? What do you think? Well, no, they weren't. I, I think, <laughs> Billy, there, there's two things. And of course, you're talking to a person who's actually never sent an email. If I need to have one <laughs> sent, I asked Billy to do it and I have, and last time I looked, 19,800 and something unanswered emails. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I do think this exchange, this, this work, and this incredible work, something like a 3D printer, mm -hmm. what, what Jarvik and I did was really uh, incredible when you think, it gets more incredible with time. No one believed you could have a non-lubricated bearing. It's not possible. A non-lubricated bearing, a bearing in the bloodstream that without lubrication. And in fact, in the 60s, there had been a couple of experiments and they both failed and demonstrated that you couldn't have a non-lubricated bearing. Well, actually, Rob didn't know that and I certainly didn't know it. I, I thought those old engineering papers were so boring. I'd, put me to sleep immediately. And, but he would make the pump. He's a very good machinist. You know, he's married to Marilyn Von Savant at the highest IQ in the world. And she funded the uh, making of the pump. He would send it down to me. And uh, I had some uh, Cullen Foundation money that I used to uh, implant the uh, pump in an experimental animal. And the first time he put it in, it lasted three days. We sent it back. It did just what everybody said it would do. It froze. Hmm. Sent it back to Jarvik. He worked on it, worked on it, sent it back. Three months later, we put in another calf. It lasted two weeks. Back to Jarvik. He worked on it, worked on it. Three months later, he comes back, and it lasts a little longer. That took us about four years. Hmm of doing that, back and forth, back and forth. He told me later, he told uh, Billy and I at the same time, that if it hadn't been for the success of the hemopump, he'd gotten so discouraged he would have given up. Mm -hmm. But with the hemopump showing you could have that 25,000 RPM pump spinning, he stuck with it. Now, this is an art form, you know. He was somehow making that bearing. I don't even know how he did it. Uh, because it, it was a, a remarkable accomplishment. And, and, but it went back and forth, and back and forth. We, we can do now with what Billy alluded to, this 3D printer, and, and they do it in our we lab. We have it in our lab. We have our own 3D printer. And, and, and we're now uh, printing in titanium with selective laser centering. And these young <laughs> engineers, you know, I don't even... When they told me this thing was sensing 20,000 times a second, I said, what, you mean a minute or two, two minutes? No, a second. It positions it. So I don't even like, that's like the, the uh, email. I don't even want to think about it. So <laughs> I, I just uh, accept it. But he, they can do in a week what it took us about three and a half or four years to do in the 80s. And uh, I think that has been a huge advance. One of the problems is a human problem. Once we start a regulatory agency, and, uh, and these are well-meaning meaning, uh, meeting people. Brutus was an honorable man. And, uh, <laughs> That's what I was talking about. And the, uh, but once you get bogged down in that, it, it really does uh, impede our, our moving ahead. I, I think, as I said, I, I know how to deal with it. That pump we put in, we could put in two of them. That's it, with the FDA. That was the rule, you could put in two of them. We put in, in the patient you saw that was very successful. The next patient we put it in was a patient that just bled to death after the surgery. It was 
it was our fourth time, and we, we operated on her because of our heart, not because of our head. Uh, but, and that's it. We couldn't do any more. The company doesn't want to make them because they don't make any money off of them. Yeah. So we can't, that we, could, we could file a, an FDA protocol to work with the FDA uh, and do, say, 10 patients like that, but we couldn't unless the company gave us the pumps. And they won't give us the pumps because there's, you know, back to the city of man again, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no money in it. Why don't we wrap up with where you wanted to leave off? Yeah, I just want to show you what we're working on now. This is the thing that Mattress Mac and others have helped fund. Uh, Daniel Timms was working with a loosely knit team spread out all over the world. There are some in Aachen, Germany, some in Japan, uh, some back in Australia. He couldn't get anyone's attention. Well, he got our attention, and we've recruited him here. The whole team has left their homes. They all live in Houston now and work in the Texas Heart Institute. And this is a computer print. Uh, it's just a, a computer diagram showing the device. It has one moving part, this rotor right here, that's floating in a magnetic field. This is our 3D printer. It allows us to take anything from that computer program and hold it in our hands the next day. We actually print out all the components and put it together. These are all, this is the motor underneath the surface here. These are the three magnets that cause the rotor to float. It adjusts the floating position 20,000 times a second. Here we put it together. You can see how much smaller it is than any previous artificial heart. This had 750 moving parts. This has one. It'll never wear out. Here it is implanted in an animal. This is an animal with a printed heart, and he doesn't seem to mind at all. And here he is eating hay. And here I think I've got a picture of him walking on a treadmill. Happy cow, his heart has one moving part floating in a magnetic field. We're confident this will be the first practical artificial heart in the history of, of the efforts, and it's coming out of Houston, Texas, and out of Texas Heart Institute and Bud Frazier, my life. Thank you. So, that's a great way to end it. Thank you so much for coming out, and again, thanks to the Manila and the Mitchell Center for supporting my show. And and having, uh, letting things like this happen. We have an incredible city, if it's not obvious already. All right, thank you very much.